This is Andy Osbaugh from Duke University School of Medicine. This presentation will explore the treatment of various pneumonia syndromes with a focus on Community Acquired Pneumonia, or CAP. The learning objectives for this module are first to understand the importance of the clinical features of the patient, including severity of illness and other comorbidities in planning therapy. Second, to consider the most common bacterial causes of CAP and the associated microbial factors of antibiotic susceptibility and resistance that influence our choices of therapy. Third, to review three classes of antibiotics that are commonly used to treat pneumonia, the macrolides, tetracyclines, and quinolones. After reviewing various clinical guidelines outlining specific antibiotic recommendations in pneumonia, we will discuss vaccinations against common respiratory pathogens as preventive strategies against lung infections. The clinical status of patients with pneumonia can vary widely, ranging from a mild illness and an otherwise well outpatient to a severe and immediately life-threatening condition requiring hospitalization. Clinicians have therefore developed decision-making tools such as the CURB-65 index to try to predict which patients with pneumonia are at the highest risk of poor outcomes and therefore to determine who needs hospitalization and more aggressive antimicrobial therapy. This mnemonic device defines clinical factors that each increase the risk of adverse outcomes in pneumonia, such as confusion, uremia or renal failure, rapid respiratory rate, blood pressure changes, and advanced age. With such tools, we are forced to define potential complications of pneumonia, such as impending respiratory failure and other organ system dysfunction. This risk calculator and similar tools help us to guide our decisions about how to monitor and treat individual patients. The more of these factors that are present in an individual patient, the more aggressive one should be in terms of hospitalization, pursuing specific etiologies, and accelerating therapy. How do we actually choose among the many antibiotics at your disposal for those that are particularly helpful in treating pneumonia? Among the most common bacterial causes of pneumonia, there are several important microbial factors that drive our treatment decisions. For example, Streptococcus pneumoniae, the most common cause of community acquired pneumonia, used to be predictably susceptible to penicillin. However, over the past few decades, it has developed widespread resistance to penicillin. More recently, it has also demonstrated increasing resistance to other expanded beta-lactams. Beta Haemophilus influenzae, another common respiratory pathogen, often makes a beta-lactamase that confers resistance to many penicillin-type antibiotics. If patients have been taking antibiotics for other reasons prior to the onset of pneumonia, this recent antibiotic exposure can also predispose them to lung infections with antibiotic-resistant pathogens. Also, many atypical bacterial lung pathogens such as Mycoplasma, Chlamydophila, and Legionella are unresponsive to cell wall active antibiotics such as the beta-lactams. Before discussing specific recommendations for the treatment of com community acquired pneumonia, I would first like to introduce three classes of antibiotics that are often used in the treatment of various pneumonia syndromes. The macrolide class of antibiotics includes drugs such as erythromycin, as well as two newer agents, azithromycin and clarithromycin. The macrolide antibiotics work by inhibiting bacterial protein synthesis. These drugs bind to the 50S ribosomal subunits in bacteria at the site where proteins are being produced. By blocking the exit channel of the growing polypeptide chains, macrolides result in the death of a susceptible bacterial cell. Like all antibiotics, macrolides have a specific spectrum of bacteria that they inhibit. These include many typical and common bacteria such as methicillin-sensitive Staph aureus, as well as many Streptococcus species. The later generation macrolides, azithromycin and clarithromycin, have some activity against gram-negative bacteria such as Haemophilus influenzae. Very relevant for this talk, macrolides are often active against the atypical bacterial path uh, pathogens of pneumonia such as Mycoplasma, Chlamydophila, and Legionella. Altogether, the spectrum of activity makes these drugs very effective for treating many patients with respiratory infections. Other organisms inhibited by macrolides include Helicobacter pylori and various mycobacterial species. In terms of side effects, macrolides can frequently cause GI disturbances such as nausea, 
especially erythromycin. Macrolide use can also result in cardiac repolarization delays and prolongation of the QT interval on the EKG, so care must be taken if co-administering with other agents that share this property. Tetracyclines are a distinct class of antibiotics that share ribosome binding and protein synthesis inhibition as their mechanism of antibacterial action. In contrast to the macrolides, tetracyclines bind the 30S ribosomal subunit. At this site, they block the incoming transfer RNA, or tRNA, docking required for peptide elongation. Some, sp some specific names of drugs in this class include tetracycline, doxycycline, and minocycline. Like the macrolides, tetracyclines are also able to inhibit the growth of many common respiratory pathogens, such as the atypical bacteria and methicillin-sensitive Staph aureus. Tetracyclines are also used as primary therapy for many other bacteria, such as the rickettsiae, the causes of tick-borne spotted fevers. Important side effects from this group of medications include GI intolerance and photosensitivity. When used in children, tetracyclines can cause significant tooth discoloration. The last new group of antibiotics that I would like to introduce is the quinolones. These drugs work by inhibiting specific enzymes required for supercoiling of bacterial DNA. Typically, these enzymes known as DNA gyrases or topoisomerases cause nicks in DNA, allowing the chromatin to relax from a supercoiled state and to be better able to undergo transcription and replication. One of the first quinolones to be widely used was ciprofloxacin. The main spectrum of this drug included aerobic gram-negative rods and methicillin-sensitive Staph aureus. When this drug was introduced, it was one of the first times that serious infections due to many gram-negative rods could be treated with potent oral antibiotics due to its, its excellent oral bioavailability. Later generations of quinolones were created that modified the very narrow spectrum of ciprofloxacin to include additional respiratory pathogens such as strep Streptococcus pneumoniae and the atypicals. These newer quinolones, often were referred to as the respiratory quinolones, include moxifloxacin, levofloxacin, and gemifloxacin. These drugs are widely used but have significant potential side effects, including uh, CNS irritation, often presenting as excessive agitation in elderly patients taking these medications. Quinolones can also cause a prolonged QT interval, and they've been associated with cartilage and joint defects, limiting their use in growing children. Various groups, such as the American Thoracic Society and the Infectious Diseases Society of America, have developed specific treatment recommendations for patients with community-acquired pneumonia to help doctors in their clinical decision-making. I've tried to summarize some of the major points of these guidelines in the following charts. As you will see, the recommendations often suggest an accelerating pattern of antibiotics with increasing complexity of the, of the patient's clinical status and increasing complexity of the potential pathogens. For example, in otherwise well patients without significant other medical issues who present with an uncomplicated community-acquired community pneumonia, treatment with an oral macrolide or doxycycline is often reasonable empiric therapy. However, if the patient has significant other medical illnesses, such as underlying lung disease, kidney dysfunction, or diabetes, these conditions may place the patient at a higher risk for complicated pneumonia, and an expanded antimicrobial spectrum may be warranted. In these patients, treatment recommendations can still include outpatient oral options, such as a respiratory quinolone, or the combination of certain beta-lactams, either amoxicillin, clavulonic acid, or cefuroxime, plus a macrolide to cover the atypicals. As mentioned before, if the patient has taken antibiotics within the preceding three months, it is generally recommended that one choose a different regimen, including different antibiotic classes uh, to, which, to what the patient has taken in the recent past. For patients requiring hospitalization for the treatment of pneumonia based on their clinical status, most groups recommend either a respiratory quinolone or initial therapy with intravenous antibiotics, such as third-generation cephalosporins, amoxicillin-cell-bactam, or carbapenems, such as ertapenem. 
Additionally, these patients requiring hospitalization should also be treated with an agent covering atypical pathogens, such as a macrolide. All patients who are sick enough to be admitted to intensive care units for pneumonia should likely receive parenteral antibiotics that cover typical and atypical bacterial pathogens. Common regimens include the beta-lactam-based regimens mentioned in the prior slide, plus either a macrolide or a respiratory quinolone. And penicillin allergic patients can often be safely treated with estreonam in the place of traditional uh, beta-lactams. Even though we have focused on antibacterial therapy for common causes of community-acquired pneumonia, I need to again emphasize that respiratory viruses, zoonotic infections, and unusual pathogens can also cause pneumonia syndromes. Therefore, these recommendations are just that, initial guidelines that can never substitute for continued close observation of patients and documentation of clinical improvement. With this in mind, how can we prevent community community-acquired pneumonias in many of our outpatients. Since respiratory viruses, such as influenza, can predispose patients to develop pneumonia, the seasonal influenza vaccine should be offered to all patients. Additionally, vaccination against streptococcus pneumonia is also an effective strategy to prevent invasive pneumococcal infections in many of our highest risk patients. Two forms of this vaccine are currently available. Both attempt to induce protective immunity against polysaccharide antigens present in the pneumococcal capsule. It is well known that prior exposure to specific capsular types of this microorganism often protects from infection due to bacteria from the same capsule antigens. The standard pneumococcal vaccine includes 23 capsular antigens, and it is therefore referred to as the 23-valent vaccine. It is recommended to be used in patients older than 65, as well as in adults with many chronic medical illnesses such as chronic kidney failure and chronic lung disease. Also, given the importance of the spleen in preventing pneumococcal infections, all splenectomized patients should be vaccinated. Another pneumococcal vaccine is best used in patients who are less able to develop an immune response against the polysaccharides present in the standard vaccine. In the 13-valent conjugated vaccine, there's a physical link between the 13 polysaccharide antigens with haptins, or protein-like antigens, that stimulate an immune reaction against the capsule components. It has long been known that children are less able to develop immune responses to polysaccharides, and more recent evidence suggests that older patients also may have difficulty responding to these antigens. Therefore, I predict that the conjugated vaccine will become even more widely used in the coming years, beyond the standard recommendation for use in young children. Together, these vaccinations have been demonstrated to reduce the incidence of pneumonia in many of our highest risk patients.